Even those of us that have had many of these experiences, we don't know everything that's possible in, in this scenario. So some people will say, I saw a shadow man. Some people see an old hag. Some people don't see anything at all. Some people get dragged to a window. Some people have an out-of-body experience. Some people see technological things. They see lights and fiber optics, and it's more technological hallucinations. And some people hear voices and some don't. And some people see little fairies crawling up and down their bodies. And so I, I think where sleep paralysis experiencers have to support one another is we're not in competition to see who's figured it out. And we're not in competition, like who's had the more scary experience. And I think that when we run into someone who has also experienced it and their experience is wildly different than ours, then rather than saying like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. What we need to say is, I need the piece of the puzzle that you have, because the more of us that get together and put our little pieces on the table, we're going to be able to put a picture together. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chariot. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. We got sleep paralysis episode this week, but first, Luke. Yes, Nate. We've been teasing it for a long time. This is the little people? <laughs> we found them. Found them, yeah. They got little houses. Pretty close, but not close enough. Oh, I know what it is. BlurryCon. Yeah, folks out there, BlurryCon. It's happening. This is for real. This is a real. This is not a test. Who's going to be there, Luke? Well, you and I are, Nate. Yeah, we'll be there. Bigfoot may be there. He's a little elusive as far as booking. He'll be in a DeLorean shooting t-shirts. We're going to have uh, Tim Alberino. Laura Sanger, Doug Van Dorn, Derek Olson of Meg Megalithic Marvels, and our good friend Tony Merkel from the uber popular Confessionals podcast. And we're going to do it. Really doing it, Harry. <laughs> That's right. Can you imagine? A year ago, we didn't know what we were doing. Now, we still don't know what we're doing. So set your DeLorean time machines to February 25th, 2023. Go there now. It'll be starting shortly if you do that. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us... Tickets go on sale this week, and there's going to be a limited number, Nate. That's right. We have a limited number of tickets, and if you're a member of the show, you'll get an email to buy tickets early. And if you're not a member, consider signing up. Get yourself a uh, the bonus perks here at Blurry Creatures. You get access to unreleased episodes, chat rooms, and a bunch of other cool stuff. But uh, also, you get to buy tickets to events early and things like this. So BlurryCreatures.com slash members. Become a member. Get access. But... For everybody else, Friday morning, 11 a.m., and you can buy tickets then. Thank you guys so much for loving this show, supporting us, and kind of making this happen. A bunch of people rallied around, and Tim Alberino's coming to town, and so, hey, we're doing it. We're really doing it. It's happening, Nathan. So without any further ado, let's get Vicky Joy on this podcast. Once again, Blurry Con's coming February 25th, 2023. See you guys there. Welcome, Vicki Joy Anderson, to the podcast, Blurry Creatures. Thanks for coming on our show. You're the author of the book, They Only Come Out at Night, which is about sleep paralysis, those who don't know. We get more emails about sleep paralysis. I think it, it's almost in the line of like Bigfoot sightings of the paranormal. Like Everyone's had their, in this space, if they listen to our show, they're always like, my grandma saw Bigfoot or something, but it's like sleep paralysis, something that 
most people either had some sort of experience with it or, you know, just something about the sleep in general. So welcome to Blurry Creatures. Thanks. Uh, if, you ha- if, if you haven't listened to the show, we always kick off the conversation. What are your thoughts on Bigfoot? Do you have any thoughts <laughs> on Bigfoot? I, well, I do. So it was not anything that I ever took seriously. Or, And I mean, I grew up in a family where we talked paranormal stuff all the time. And okay. I'm talking all the way back in the 70s. I'm at the dinner table and dad's talking about Roswell. And so like um, nothing's off the table. And But Bigfoot never really got talked about a lot. And it wasn't until maybe four or five years ago when I, along with millions of other people, went down the David Politis rabbit trail with the whole missing 411. And, you know, he originally was searching for Bigfoot and stumbled upon this whole other phenomenon. But between that and just Ellie Marzulli and uh, people in that of that persuasion and that ilk, I started thinking about it a lot more because there's also people, I'm sure you've heard these stories where people are talking about when portals get opened, these things tend to come in and out of the portals. And now there's stuff recently that the, the Bigfoot conference that LA just got back from in Ohio, where there were people there saying, corroborating, because I've heard the story before, some people will claim that they've interacted with the Bigfoots and that they speak and that at least there is a percentage of them that are perhaps almost kind of like the watcher category where they're here to kind of protect us and take care of us and are still kind of fulfilling that original like watcher assignment. And which is interesting to me just because the only watchers that ever get any press are the 200 that came down Hermon and were bad boys. And so we always think we equate watchers with, you know, if they're a watcher, you're a demon and you're the spawn of the Nephilim and you're bad. But the fact is, only 200 of them defected and we we don't know how many there were to begin with and so perhaps they are still around and perhaps there's some that never rebelled and that they are still protecting us but it's not the same face-to-face interaction as it was before the flood and i i also think we're at a disadvantage here in america though i see the tide changing where because of the scientific method and our kind of Greek stoicism and our scientific worship, we're not very open culturally to a lot of the supernatural. When you go into other countries where they are open-minded to that, they see a lot more than we do and they interact with these beings a lot more than we do. They know more about them. They also, for the most part, know enough to not conjure them and interact with them you know they they know okay these things are dangerous and so uh, i think we have a lot to learn from cultures that have embraced more of an ability to comprehend the supernatural mm. you, you hit like a that. lot there you hit a lot there i like yeah that. i know you, it's you, like... hit, you hit portals and politis <laughs> and yeah. we got the we got we got some enoch and <laughs> yep yep, yep. herman that's a nice nice little mixing bowl we put it all in there I like well it. yeah and if you listen to our <laughs> show out. from the beginning our our listeners know all those things and we've we've dove, dove down those rabbit holes quite a bit but i i think i think luke correct me if i'm wrong here but uh that's the first time anyone has said bigfoot is like a protector it is of people oh, so i, like I yeah, like it. and I it mean, makes sense there's, because there's we hear stories, those stories. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's like saving kids and stuff. Like so, that there are like other ones where they're not so kind. But th- that's yeah. always been always been the rub and been hard to sort of Nate, as Nate and I go through this. Is that sometimes it seems like Bigfoot's benevolent and like you know people say that could be like a deception or you, you, no, you don't know. But there is also the weird stories about. The, the big guy doing like helpful things so I don't, yeah i mean yeah. i don't know the ones in particular are the ones with like little kids go missing in the woods and they're gone for three days in sub-zero temperatures and, and this bear creature took care of them for three or four days i mean i've read that probably 10 times since, since i got into the bigfoot thing and you're like what kind of mean creature takes a kid and then brings it back yeah, yeah. but then there's other ones where the bigfoot supposedly just attacks these camps and rips people apart so yeah right <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I know. There's so many onion layers to it. And and I think since writing this book, I've the the verse I've quoted over and over and over again with all the people who've asked me questions or sent me emails is I just keep taking them back to first John. Test the spirits to know whether they are from God, because as we know, 
there are a lot of entities in the astral realm that present themselves as spirit guides and as lovers and as friends. And they give all sorts of information and people re report that they were filled with love and light and they've never felt so much love before. And, but then on the other hand, what's so fascinating to me about scripture is we have many examples in scripture where people meet an angelic being. A messenger comes down, usually with some sort of prophetic event or glad tidings. And so we know these are third heaven entities being sent by God. They're, they're friends of humanity. And yet almost all of them, the first things out of their mouth, fear not. And we have people collapsing and fainting and trembling and being sick for weeks after these encounters. And so I always try to tell people, if you're going solely on your emotion after interacting with one of these second or third heaven entities or whatever they are, we can't just go off of our emotion because we've all read enough of those UFO abductee stories where they'll say they had total control over my visual cortex. They had control over my emotion. Some people report when they're in the presence of these things having just euphoric like feelings, some of them almost even to the level of orgasm. We hear this all the time with the UFO abductees. And so if we know for a fact that these things to some degree have control over our emotions and our brain chemicals and our dopamine, then to solely decide whether or not an entity from another dimension or plane or reality is good or bad based upon whether or not we were scared or we were filled with some sort of loving feeling is just the, the peak of foolishness. And so I tell anybody who's interested in these paranormal topics, you got to read and study and meditate on and memorize the book of First John because First John was actually written after Revelation. It was one of the last books, if not the last book, First, Second, Third John that John wrote. So everything that John wrote in the book of First John, he was informed of all those visions he saw in Patmos. So he had seen the end of the world and he'd seen these creatures and the beast and the woman and the stars and those seals and the trumpets. And so when he is saying, okay, this is the last message I'm going to give to planet Earth before I die and my pen goes silent. And the message he had for humanity was test the spirits. There's many antichrists. There's liars. There's false prophets. Test the spirits. This is how you know whether something's from God. That was the message. And so it's as relevant today, if not more, as it was back then. In fact, I think it's fascinating that thousands of years ago, that was the most relevant topic yeah. as well, mm -hmm. uh, that there are angelic entities parading around as angels of light who know how to mimic light and love, who have messages of peace and hope and will answer all your questions and solve your problems and who will be your companion. And they are straight up evil. So we got to learn how to test the spirits. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you called that out because that is the new age deception, right? And, and, and it needs to be called out because it's it's the, you know, the ayahuasca DMT, these people that, that go and they, they access the spiritual realm and have these, what they consider to be very positive experiences. That is the allure, right? They, they, that they, people are, it's follow your heart. And it's funny because the Bible says that our heart is the, is the wellspring of all evil, right? Like this idea mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, that we can be manipulated by, by, in, you name, you called it out, spirit guides and the, and these encounters, these entities that, that seem to have a positive lasting thing. And, and I think that's the, one of the big deceptions. It's also, Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, some of the deception that we get in sort of in the alien narrative, Nate, like when we, you know, I think about when we talk to to Scott Walter about, and he was saying, oh, there are friends, they're here, they're here to help us. It's the whole like almost ancient alien thing, like they, they are our, our our helpers, senators, yes. right? And it's yeah. and it's like, man, this is all bad. Well, that reminds me of kind of what you brought up in the beginning. I want to talk a little bit more about that before we jump into the sleep paralysis topic. Is just like these watchers that they were here to help us. So one th one question is, what do you think the watchers specifically were doing? And secondly, if you do test the spirits, what do you do? What do you ask them? I mean, let's get real down to the basics here. Do you ask them like, is Jesus your father or or what? And, and most people don't, I don't know if people ever actually have a moment where they can ask these entities a question that, that bold, but is that what we do? Yeah, that that's a tough one too, because I, I mean, 
I strongly discourage interacting with these things. First of all, they're liars. They're, you know, yeah. their, their father, Satan, is a liar from the beginning. And I, I remember in high school, a friend of mine coming to me on Monday morning and she'd been at some slumber party and they had, they had dabbled with a Ouija board and she was all excited because they had asked the Ouija board because it was like three couples. It was three girls and three boys and they were all like dating each other. And they had asked the Ouija board, will all of us be married after high school? And the Ouija board had said yes. And so she was so excited because it meant that her boyfriend was going to propose to her. And I said, well, did you specify, will we all be married to each other? Or did you just say, will we all be married after high school? And she's like, well, we just said, well, but they, he knew what I meant. And I'm like, they're tricksters. They're not going to tell you the truth. And so I, I made just this wild prophetic statement. I said, I'll bet you anything you don't marry him because I don't trust those things. And it was funny because all three of those couples got married shortly after high school, none of them to each other. And so we don't know if we're going to get anything you ask one of these things, it's a crapshoot whether or not they're telling you the truth. Mm. And so, I mean, it would behoove them to tell you the truth because the more they can tell you information with accuracy, the more they're going to look legit, the more they're going to look powerful, the more they're going to look trustworthy. Uh, but where this question gets really complicated in today's era is, I think back in the 50s and the 60s, you know, there was this little litmus test that if you had, you know, uh, sleep paralysis or an astral experience, you would, you know, and they were presenting themselves as I'm an angel or I'm a spirit guide that you, you would have to say something like proclaim with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And they would, Oh, they, I can't do it. Ah. And then, you know, it was just like, now I know it mm -hmm. is, but I'm sorry to be controversial, but these guys are liars. I, and especially now that you get into the realm of all of these fake Jesuses and these new age Jesuses and these astral Jesuses. And you can get all the way into the etymology of the word Lord and the Canaanite roots of it, meaning Baal. And so technically, because they are tricksters, any of them could say Jesus is Lord because they could say, well, our Lord is Baal and Jesus is this uh, new age entity that we've now claimed and named Jesus. And so even if you say to one of these things, proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, I don't know that my definition, my biblical definition of Jesus is their definition, because we know even going into the Mormon church, their concept of Jesus is much different than an evangelical Jesus. And so I think that a evil entity could probably easily say Jesus is Lord, because in that entity's mind, they can mean something different because as we've seen with other things going on in our country right now, mm. and I think this is actually a Marxist philosophy. If you want to control a people, change their language, you manipulate the language mm. and yeah. you get things to not mean what they really mean anymore. And I'm an English major, so I'm a grammar nerd and I love words and the etymology of them. And I, I tend to be very, you know, hyper vigilant with what things mean. And I'm to the point where I don't even like this pop culture mentality where we now have words that mean the opposite of mm -hmm. what you really mean. Like, oh, that's bad, you know, which means it's good. And yeah. um, like, oh, I haven't talked to you in a minute. And that means 10 years. And I know it's just like, we're trying to be cool. We're trying to be hip. But my what I always try to convince people, especially Christians of, is our communication device with God Almighty, who's a pretty hard being to get our minds around because of our sin and our fallen nature and because of how much has been corrupted and the deception that's out there. This word of God is the only chance I've got to try to understand this God. So if you're now telling me that I have to relearn the English language and that I got to learn a new language, like some cool little hip language, I'm going to stick with the English language because as, as, as much as I can understand my language is as much as I'm going to be able to unpack the word of God. And so the more and more and more and more we dumb down the word of God and we have all these little, you know, translations that just completely pith the history and the culture and the context and the geography and the language out of the original context. We're getting further and further and further away from ever being able to grasp what those words really say. And so I, I don't know if there's this perfect little litmus test, getting back to your question, where we're going to be able to, like, when we test the spirits, I don't think that that testing is something that we do between the entity. 
we do that testing with the Holy Spirit. We go to the Holy Spirit. We're asking the Holy Spirit to communicate to us. We're asking him to communicate Mm. through the word of God, through the counsel of others. And like what we're doing right now, uh, dialogue and fellowship with other believers Mm. who have studied to show themselves approved and we're matching things up with doctrine. And so our, when we test the spirits, that's not something that we're doing with the evil. Mm. That's something that we're doing with the good. We go to the people we can trust for the truth. And I'll give you just a very recent example. I got an email recently from someone saying, I have an angel who has come to me and asked for help. And they were talking about crystals. I've conjured this angel with these crystals and I have I helped a little girl pass from the afterlife into her new reincarnated body. And now that they know I have this gift, they want to use me and help them shuttle all of these these confused souls into their next reincarnated self. And so uh, the way I answered it is I just I took three parts of scripture and I said, well, first, let's let's talk about who has the keys to death and Hades and who has the right to shuttle souls in other dimensions to the places they need and want to go. And let's talk about crystals and let's talk about uh, crystal balls and divination. Now let's look at all the verses that talk about divination. And now let's look at all the verses that talk about reincarnation. And so I basically didn't say any, I don't ever tell people how to think, but I just had three lists of the verses. This is what it says about divination. This is what the word Mm. says about reincarnation. This is what the word says about who has the keys. And I never got a response back, but that's the way we test the spirits. If someone is coming to us from another dimension and saying, I'm here on behalf of God, is the mission that they're giving us a biblical mission? Or is it self? Or is, is it something that's promoting the evil agenda? And so these are the ways that I test the spirits is I always just go to the word of God. And it's surprising to me, but no matter how modern we get and how far away we stray away from the the culture and the society that that word was originally written in, there's, it's still so much relevance for what we're, what we're, we're doing today, because in the same way that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, mm-hmm. Satan's the same yesterday, today, and forever, not because he's eternal, not because he's sovereign, but because he's got one agenda and one line, the same thing he told Adam and Eve, you can be as the gods. It's the same line. He hasn't even changed his line. You can have Christ consciousness. You can ascend. Right. You can become a higher vibrational being. It's the same exact line. He's extremely predictable. One thing I was thinking when you were saying all this is like the personhood of Christ is so important to understand, you know, Christ being the son of God, the creator outside of time. And I think that, you know, when we talk to guys like Dr. Michael Heiser on this show, he says, you know, the personhood of Jesus has always been attacked throughout history. And one way you can test the spirits is I think understanding sort of the biblical, the, the hierarchy of characters. You know, and I think that that's what we do on blurry creatures. We kind of we we kind of throw out a catalog of what are these creatures are, where they come from, and just who Christ is has really grown in my mind since doing this podcast for two years. And I I, I don't I think there's some things that were I grew up hearing, and I just didn't understand. Like, yeah, Jesus is the creator, and I'm like, well, no, he created all this and all these entities and all this with all these things that are going on, and and there is this deception of fracturing him into a thousand different pieces, trying to get you on some other rabbit hole of of who he is and who God says he is. And this is my son, you know, who I'm well pleased. And I think that for whatever reason, you know, as a grown man, it's like, how come I didn't really have a concept of like a real foundational understanding of who Jesus is and why he's the savior and what he's saving us from. So all, all great stuff. Thanks for, thanks for diving into the, you know, you Into know the, the mistake weird. about Nate. The, it, what? See, this is what comes to mind is Talladega Nights, it, where he he says, "I like to think of my Jesus, you know, as with giant angel wings, and he's the lead, <laughs> he's the leading vocals for Leonard Skinner and <laughs> an angel band, and I'm in the front row." But and I say that as a joke, but at the same time, it it is the that is the symptom of our society where people have decided that they're going to remake Jesus in their image. Is it, is it, mm-hmm. is it, is it woke Jesus? Is it, well, my Jesus does do this or does do this, or my Jesus validates this and and not that. And, and I think it's super important. Like you were saying, and, and piggybacking off what Vicky was saying that we just understand who 
you know, who, who Jesus is. And, and mm-hmm. we have the Holy Spirit. We've been given the Holy Spirit for what you're saying for that discernment. And I just find that fascinating. But I kept thinking, man, Talladega Nights. I got I got to <laughs> we like we like movie quotes. Yeah, on this yeah, show, so I, had to, I had to drop that in there. But I, love I, it. I think this is a good backdrop and for you to, to talk a bit about, you know, about your book, because as you said in the beginning, you spent 15 years researching this. And and like Nate had said at the beginning, that's the top. We haven't talked specifically about sleep paralysis. This is this is a common thing, like a common enough that you're saying that you're hearing all kinds of stuff from people. One, but one of the things is, is that it's been allegedly that you know it's always the whole thing. The sci- the science is settled, right? It's it's the idea that this is there's a scientific thing for it, and you know it's not really something sitting in your chest. And but I think people have experienced it. I know I have at least once or twice had like this thing where you can't breathe, you can't get out and you, and you're trying, you know, in your spirit, you got to get out the name of Jesus and you can't get it out. Like mm-hmm. it's terrifying. I mean, to call it night terrors, you sleep paralysis, all, all the above, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear you talk about what's really going on here. Because like Nate had said, one of the things we do with the show as well is we look for the truth, right? We're lo- looking for better answers to questions that, that maybe people don't really like to ask or don't, or the church doesn't ask or, or mm-hmm. gets, or dances around, right? Because yeah. a lot of times they're scared. And then yeah. a lot of times they challenge your paradigm. If you've drawn a little fence around your faith, you know, people don't want to get outside of that because you have to start spending your mind to think about things that to the, the, the irony in that to me is that it's the things that, that you said, as you say, John, that that our that our church fathers and the and the ancients thought about, and it was a, almost a daily reality. It was a daily reality, or the supernatural was a reality. Yeah, absolutely. So this is an extremely triggering topic to use a cultural buzz term. I love triggering; it's so descriptive. But it's really triggering for everybody because, on one hand, it triggers the New Age people because I'm stepping on toes. I'm saying this isn't the great, wonderful like answer to life's existence that you think it is. Be careful. It's triggering to Christians. Despite how supernatural everything in the Bible is, there is a lot of fear when paranormal topics come up. But it's also very triggering to the people who have had sleep paralysis. And I walked this journey myself. There's a point where when you start to realize, okay, wait, that wasn't just nightmares. Oh, I wasn't just have a stressful job or I didn't just eat spaghetti too close to bedtime there. Like when you start to realize, okay, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I was legit this helpless five-year-old kid alone in a dark bedroom facing a a demonic entity. Are you kidding me? And so it's one of those, like, uh, in hindsight, when you realize what it really was, it becomes terrifying. So with that said, it can be very triggering to people who have even, even would agree with me. Like, I know this exists and I know it's real because I've had it. It's also triggering because sometimes people are not ready to really evaluate why is it happening to me and what's it about and how do I get rid of this? So the reason why I wrote the book, because I, I could have just done this for my own and we've already touched upon it. And that is that I'm starting to see this terrifying inability within the church where people have very classic astral encounters with these entities and they come to church on Sunday so excited because they had a Holy Spirit encounter. And this kind of inability to tell the difference between second and third heaven uh, encounters. And so what started to really spook me was if we can't tell the difference in our bedrooms between a second and a third heaven encounter, are we as a whole, as a body of believers, going to understand when the false Jesus comes back? Are we going to be able to tell the real guy from the false guy? And we know from scripture that it's going to be such a convincing delusion that even the elect, if that was possible, would fall for it. So in other words, uh, we, we also, apart from the Holy Spirit, would be so convinced by, by this false Jesus. And so I just think that it is so important that we test the spirits We have to be in the word. We have to know the word. It's not enough anymore to just go to church on Sundays, listen to someone else's research, someone else's, the results of someone else's time and research and devotions. We have to have a personal relationship and more than just praying a prayer and going to church and listening to Caleb, you know, or I don't smoke and swear, you know, like we we have to graduate beyond the the youth group definition of what it means to be a Christian. You know, when we're in youth group and we're teenagers, we're told don't drink, smoke, have sex. And like, as long as you don't do those three things, you're saved. And walking in intimacy with Christ isn't about two or three things that we don't do anymore. It's about a whole transformational 
lifestyle. It's dying to the old man, living this whole new set apart existence. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people are missing in this is that a lot of this paranormal stuff, one way or the other, it's a transformational experience. Anyone that has had a lot of these supernatural experiences, they don't just brush themselves on and move on with their life. Many of them, because they're terrified, will come to a deeper and deeper clinging to Christ and they'll, you know, cast off the, the things in their life that they think are causing this and they're closing doors. But for other people, it intrigues them and they become very interested in the paranormal and in ghost hunting and in psychic abilities and learning how to astral project. There's not too many people I know who've experienced this like repeatedly. You know, there's people where, oh, I think it happened to me once. You know, I'm talking about the people who have been harassed by this a good deal of their life. It is impossible not to be as transformed by this. It, it affects you at a soul level. And even though I was raised in church and, you know, went to Bible college and got my little Bible degree and, you know, all that stuff. At the same time, there was this tangible war for my flesh and for my affections and for my heart, because I, at the same time that I was growing up, uh, trying to pursue Christ and pursue the word, I had this extremely dark streak in me that I was always fighting with. And so it was always this desire to listen to the heavy metal music and to go to the metal concerts mm. and wear all the skull t-shirts and the black nail polish and like the whole, like I'm goth came a little bit after me back, back when I was young, there was no goth. You were just, you were a metal head kind of a thing. And there was always this, there was this war between wanting to be a really devout, upright follower of Jesus, but then this desire to just be dark and I, it was just constantly at war. And I think it took me a long time to figure out that all of those sleep paralysis experiences influenced my personality. Mm. Because when you're seeing these things in your bedroom every night and you're familiarizing yourself with them, what's scary at first, then, then there's a curiosity. And then there's like, well, what is this? And, and then there's almost like, well, why are they coming after me and not everybody else? Like, I, there's something special about me. And mm. so there's all these layers and levels of processing. Why are these things targeting me? And so you almost kind of em embrace it like, well, I'm familiar with all of these dark things, so maybe I'm dark. And it took me a long time to clean all that garbage out of my life, you know. And I kind of thought once I once I clean all this stuff up and I close all the doors, then, you know, all this is going to go away and everything's going to be great. But e even even after having, you know, done all the cliche things, you know, you have your little bonfire, you get rid of your metal music and, you know, you pray all your Mason ancestor prayers and you get rid of all your souvenirs from overseas, you know, you do all the things. Uh, the fact of the matter is this is a war and we, Ephesians 6, 12, I mean, it's the most concise to the point verse that sums up everything going on. It's a cosmic war. Our enemies live in the heavenly places. They live in the astral. Their principalities, their powers, there's wicked forces, there's evil rulers. And so what, what I get out of that is the people that live in the heavenly places, the astral are our enemies. We're at war with them. And second of all, there's a whole roster of these things, you know, cause a lot of people get mad at me because I won't say, Demon, 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 demon. Yeah. And believe, believe me, I believe demons are involved. I believe those things that show up in the bedroom. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is demonic. Even atheists who don't even believe in God and things like that have told me, oh, it's demonic. And I'm yeah. like, what do you even mean by that? But, yeah. Yeah. but I kind of ascribe to the Michael Heiser, uh, train of thought. And he didn't come up with this. This is in the right. Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in Enoch. It's in a litany of Jewish uh, literature that the the demons are the disembodied souls of the Nephilim. And so mm -hmm. in the astral, there are all sorts of things in the astral that we know aren't specifically the disembodied souls of the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. And even if demon has a broader scope than, than the disembodied soul, maybe they're also fallen angels or they're also something else. The fact is in the astral realm, we have ascended masters, which I, I kind of liken unto modern day gibberim, like Nimrod, he became a gibberim. These ascended masters, they were in a human form at one point and they ascended to this sort of other state. And, uh, you kind of mentioned that a minute ago, sorry to butt in, but you were, you were talking about the second and third heaven. And yeah. I think that our listeners, I mean, 
I kind of think I know what you're saying, what you're saying there, but can you explain that a little yeah. bit more and see if that fits into this? Yeah, absolutely. So, it, you know, second and third heaven, they, those phrases aren't used in scripture. And so it does trigger a lot of Christians like you're making stuff up, but where, where I get it from is we have to differentiate the heavenly places in Ephesians 6, 12 from the heaven that we would talk about as Christians, because the throne room of God, where he sits on his throne and the seraphim are there saying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, day and night. And there's the seven spirits of God, the menorah flaming before his throne and its holiness. And we've got, you know, all of the, the gemstone floor and, and the, the rainbow over his throne. This is the throne room. This is, this is the holy throne room of God where he meets out justice and, uh, fulfills all of the unfurling of prophetic and redemptive history. Like this is a holy place. This is the, the presence of God is in this place. So when you read something like Ephesians 6, 12 and you read about enemies, of God who are evil and their rulers of, and dark forces and principalities. And then it says, who lives in the heavenly places? If you think that those heavenly places are heaven, now there's all sorts of doctrinal error that can come in because you can, now you can take the, you know, the occult law of reversal where Satan, it was really Jesus and Jesus was Satan and the serpent in the garden was trying to free Adam and Eve from the thought construct that God had them, you know, it all, all that right. stuff. And so if we have any confusion between the heavenly places where God has his throne and the heavenly places where all these evil things are crawling around, you can seriously contort doctrine and say, well, then if all of these demons were crawling around in heaven, then they must be good guys. And so when I talk to them, I can trust them and they're great and we're all on the same side. And so Second and third heaven is just a human way of differentiating for the sake of doctrinal accuracy that there is a heaven, which is another dimensional realm that God lives in. And then there's a heaven that's a dimensional realm that these enemies of God live in. And it's more complicated than just demons in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6.12 mentions four categories, and we know there's more because there's humans crawling around up there too. There's astral projectors and spirit mm -hmm. guides and ascended masters. So for the people that need the chapter and, and, and verse for everything, and I'm not mocking that, we're all supposed to be good Brians. But for me saying demon is, it's not, it, it's one facet of the diamond. So if I'm holding a three-dimensional diamond with 50 some facets on it, and I tell you there's one facet, then there's 50 some facets you're not ever going to be warned of. And so, yes, it is demonic. Yes, there are demons involved. Absolutely. But to just say that there's not a myriad of other supernatural entities out there and we have to know our enemy. I mean, even what Sun Zhao said, you've got, you're never going to win a war yeah. if you don't know your enemy. And so, I understand why this is triggering for the church because we want to give all glory to God. We want to give the attention and the focus to him. We want to, we want to talk about his glory and his goodness and his plan and his righteousness. And we don't want to unwittingly give glory to the enemy. But uh, at the same time, we are supposed to expose the deeds of the devil. We are called to do that. And there is so much that the enemy has gotten away with for thousands of years solely based on our ignorance of what's going on. Yeah, I think second, third heaven to me just sounds like realms, right? You talk about the realms in the kingdom and in the kingdom of heaven is a place where you, you probably don't, you're not going to have the sort of the, the creepy crawly nasties cruising around, but they exist in the spiritual realm, or whatever you want, or the spiritual space. That was good, Nate. I was going to ask the same thing. I was also going to ask, like, just on a very baseline, if you could just if you could tell us about sleep paralysis, what is it generally considered, and then like, what was the experience? What is the experiences for you, and then what and what is the experiences for the people in your research had? Because I know there's going to be people who listen to our show that are going to be able to identify with some of this because we probably all have some sort of familiarity with this. But you know, kind of, you are an English person, right? So, sort of defining what that what that is and that experience is like, and then maybe what it was you you mentioned you had a number of experiences curious about those and then also curious about some of the things people have told you and then kind of just you know the, the interplay in that when it came to to unwrapping this entire topic we, as we all know there's tons of disinformation online about what this is there's a lot of gaslighting on this topic there's a lot of poo-pooing of it and i try to really have 
every aspect of it in my book. What I really believe our modern culture's propensity to absolutely separate and vilify science from spirituality is doing harm to both sides because we are going to, as Christians, really not understand a lot of the sleep paralysis experience if we're completely ignorant of our own physiology and the aspects of our physiology that these entities are capitalizing on to make a more terrifying experience, whereas science is going to miss the boat as to motive and how to help people that suffer from this. So it's important to have both the medicine and the mystery put together. And I go at length in the book, I talk a lot about how in antiquity, the houses of healing or temples, that their medicine and spirituality were absolutely inseparable. And we even see it in the Torah. And we even see it when, when Jesus healed people. He, you know, Luke is a doctor, right? He's got a doctor on his own entourage. And he's like, well, let's get a second opinion from Luke. Let's make sure that leprosy has gone. No, he would send him to the temple, according to the Torah. And the high priest would declare whether or not he was really healed or not. And so there, there was always, within the context of the Bible and without culturally, there was always a melding of the two. And so I talk a lot in the book about the cult of Asclepius and the Asclepions, the first and second century Asclepions, Galen, the super surgeon of the second century who kind of ran the Asclepion in Pergamon, which is super interesting because we know from Revelation that Pergamon was the seat of Satan. Pergamon was where the throne of Satan was. And Antipas, the fame, uh, the, the faithful martyr who is martyred in 130 years before Galen gets on, on the scene, he was killed because he was healing people in the name of Jesus for free. And the Asclepians, which was like the big pharma of the day, they were making tons of money off of bringing these people in, sedating them. It was very, very much like you mentioned earlier, ayahuasca and DMT. It was very much like that. They would be heavily sedated. Then they would wander around in these underground catacombs until they were high and dizzy and confused and disoriented. And then they would sleep in these underground catacombs with uh, snakes crawling over them all night. and because they were high, they would be in an altered state of consciousness. They would astral project and they would meet with entities in, in the second heaven who very often would tell them, this is what you've got and this is how to cure it. And so they would wake up. They would tell the high priest slash doctor, this is what you have to do to cure me. And they would, you know, do what they needed to do. And very often, very often the people were cured because these entities in the, in the, in the astral realm are smart enough to know if you want to look and act like God, you heal people, right? And so they would then uh, take gold and silver and they would fashion, they would mold out of this gold and silver the, the body part that got healed. And that would be the payment for this. So these high priests were making a lot of money. So when Antipas came in for free and was healing people in the name of Jesus, because he wouldn't recant and offer an offering to Zeus, he was burned alive. And so mm. uh, all sorts of of interesting things there. So I do try to explain in the book that scientists, you have to understand that there's a supernatural realm and there is a demonic element to this experience. But by the same token and religious people, you need to understand that there is a uh, physiological aspects to this. So when we're in altered states of consciousness, whether it's drifting in and out of sleep, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it is deep relaxation or meditation techniques. Uh, it can even be rage, like extreme rage, hypnosis, and even sexual pornography, masturbation, things like that, where you are in, even if it's just seconds of some sort of elation or where you're in that altered state of consciousness, we're vulnerable in those states. And so I don't think it's one of these situations where the, the the experience feels like these entities are causing this paralyzation or they're sitting on you and that's why you can't move. But the fact of the matter is when you're in this altered state of consciousness, you're just naturally, by nature of your physiology, there's a portion of our sleep cycles where we are paralyzed. And it's it's there for our protection. We do this so that we don't act out our dreams. So we're not kicking, you know, our spouse or we're not sleepwalking into traffic or we're not wet in the bed, right? So 
what they do is they just capitalize on the most opportune time because we're defenseless. We're not, we're not really awake. And there's all sorts of arguments as to whether or not you're awake, you're asleep, you're both, or you're in the astral. And it, that's also very triggering to people because everybody has their idea of what's happening to them. I had an aha moment when I saw the Matrix movie, the first one years ago, when Neo is in, is in the hotel and he sees the cat and the cat loops and they're like that. It's a glitch in the Matrix. Like, so that, that cat looping tipped them off to the fact that they were in the Matrix, right? And what I noticed about my sleep paralysis experiences that I never had an answer for was I always thought I was awake because I could see my room. So clearly my eyes are open and I must be awake. But for those people who have had sleep paralysis enough times and are it, it's long enough of an experience and they're cognizant enough to like look around and test the things that they have thought about when, when the experience isn't happening is there's always a glitch mm. in the, in the bedroom. So the hotel room or the living room or the bedroom, the recliner, wherever you're, wherever you're sleeping, mm. if you look, if you have the wherewithal, amidst all the fear and everything else going on to look, you will find something in that room that does not line up with your real room. The door will be on the wrong side. It'll be on the wrong wall. You'll be on a couch instead of a chair. Or I, I had one person write to me and say, I actually, as this thing was like aggressing against me and the bed was moving, the, my headboard was slamming against the wall. And they, then they said, when I woke up, I realized I don't have a headboard. I, what was that? And so, it, I don't know if it's an overlay. I don't know if we're in the astral. I don't know if they're taking over the visual cortex. But I know that every time I've had sleep paralysis, I wake up with my eyes glued shut thinking, I'm not going to open my eyes. I don't want to see anything. I'm not going to open my eyes. I don't want to see anything. So my experience, and this is not to say that there aren't other things going on, but in my experience, I am not awake with my eyes open looking at my bedroom. I am not awake with my eyes open looking at my bedroom. I am not awake with my eyes open. There's giveaways in the room that it's not accurate. And I wake up with my eyes squeezed shut. And so uh, I, I think that there's just still a lot that we don't know. Another thing I've been kind of exploring lately, and I think Jim Wilhelmson and Alvarino, Tim Alvarino, uh, touch on this as well. And this is one of those things we were talking about earlier where it can be triggering to people who have sleep paralysis because the more we find out, Sometimes the things we find out, it's like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. This is getting to be too much. But um, one of the things that Alberino says, and I'm very intrigued by this, is he says that the experience feels like that the moment the sleep paralysis comes on, people become afraid and they say, Jesus, Jesus, get out in the name of Jesus, get out. And then it stops. And they're like, phew, that was over. That was only a couple minutes. I'm glad that's over. What he's saying, and it matches the research of Jim Wilhelmson, Wilhelmson says that sleep paralysis, similar to UFO encounters, is an abduction experience. But instead of a UFO for experimentation, you're being, you're being abducted into the astral. And I do, I do claim that in my book too, that it's an abduction experience. But what Alberino was saying is that what, what's happening is a lot of people, when they're crying out to Jesus, they think that it's, at the front end of the sleep paralysis experience, and then they're staving it off. But what might actually be happening is you've been in the astral. You have no memory of it. And when you come back into your body after that experience and you start to come into consciousness and you start saying, Jesus, 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 that that's actually the end of the encounter and that there might not be a memory of what actually just happened to you. And I'm not saying this to scare people. And believe me, when I first started coming across this information, it was frightening to me. I'm like, so even more has happened to me and I don't even know it. It's very off-putting. But I think why it's important to consider this as a possibility 
is because in, in spiritual warfare, when we want to close doors and we want to undo or reverse covenants that we've perhaps made with these entities, if we have no knowledge that that's happened, we're not ever going to cover that in prayer. We're not ever going to close those doors because we're not going to ever understand. And so that's something that I'm kind of exploring recently. But I think that all of us who have experienced this, we have to just understand there are many different sleep paralysis experiences. And even those of us that have had many of these experiences, we don't know everything that's possible in, in this scenario. So some people will say, I saw a shadow man. Some people see an old hag. Some people don't see anything at all. Some people get dragged to a window. Some people have an out-of-body experience. Some people see technological things. They see lights and fiber optics, and it's more technological hallucinations. And some people hear voices and some don't. And some people see little fairies crawling up and down their bodies. And so I, I think where sleep paralysis experiencers have to support one another is we're not in competition to see who's figured it out. And we're not in competition, like who's had the more scary experience. And I think that when we run into someone who has also experienced it and their experience is wildly different than ours, then rather than saying like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we, what we need to say is I need the piece of the puzzle that you have, because the more of us that get together and put our little pieces on the table, we're going to be able to put a picture together. The whole thing about the matrix is fascinating. It, it just makes you think like what's, you know, what's really happening here. And, and, and oftentimes we, Nate, we've talked about before, like the idea that there's something that happens when you sleep that you are more connected, susceptible. I don't know what it is to the, to the spiritual realm, because we know that we also know that like biblically speaking, God speaks people in dreams and prophetically your sons and daughters have dreams and visions, right? There's this something about that state that opens us up, but I just find that, I find that fascinating and, and it can't help but think about, trying to connect some of these dots to like even the abduction phenomenon, because it, it does sound so familiar. Well, it also lines up with, with a lot of what we just, the episode releasing this week, actually, he talks a lot about that. This, this guy, Dan, Dan Duvall, I know you've heard oh, of mm -hmm. and he, yep. his work talks about the difference between sin and iniquities. And they're looking for something in the DNA. And he was also talking towards the end of the episode about some sort of like screened AI overlay where like these entities can almost recreate like sounds like a bedroom and you think you're in it and he was talking about a lot of these things and he also said earlier kind of what you were talking about just how how vast the kingdom of darkness is and what they can do and where they come from so nothing you're saying isn't it, it it's actually very timely because we just we just kind of talked about a lot of these subjects and this week we're releasing that episode and i'm sure it's gonna create a bunch of people <laughs> members of the show chatting about you know their thoughts on all of that but i was thinking the same thing about the abduction phenomenon how it sounds similar but it sounds like those people maybe have some sort of blood iniquity that allows them to move them maybe out of a dream state into an actual craft that that's really interesting that you mentioned that nate because um i was recently talking to a friend of mine very knowledgeable in these sorts of things because he's an SRA survivor, satanic ritual mm -hmm. abuse from mm -hmm. generational Satanism. And so I was talking about how, you know, what gives these things the right to drag us into the astral? Like, I mean, we're all sinners and, and, and in fact, we all have open doors. So how come this isn't happening to everybody? And like, why certain people, why is this, the th like, how are they targeting? And so along those lines, he was talking about how in order for them and whether that is an occultist or someone with black magic which is like because there are like remote viewers like they, like this technology has been militarized like they know how to get bodies soul bodies out into the astral but he said you actually need dna to do it hmm. and so i said well obvious question i guess where are they getting the dna and so he did say that for a lot of people, they're getting it in the hospital when you're born. You know, it, it's a perfect opportunity for them because it's a whole bunch of babies who are unattended by their parents for, for those few days before they get brought home. And, and so I, I thought it was interesting because Russ Dizdar talked too about, he, he tells a story about a militarized remote viewer who was coming into his bedroom a few nights. And wow. so Russ, Russ was trying to figure out, like he knew it was, militarized because he recognized the guy he knew the guy and so this is another thing too some people have sleep paralysis but it's not a entity 
it's an actual human being. And in many cases, it's someone they recognize. It's a neighbor or it's a coworker or something. And a lot of times when that's happening, it's a, it's a clue that you're probably being remote viewed rather than a sleep paralysis thing. But what Russ said was that as he was praying and fasting through, like, how do I get this guy to stop remote viewing and coming into my bedroom at night, that he what he he concluded that he had to cast out the demon that was basically providing the the demon was the coattails that this guy was riding in on so to speak and so the second or third time this happened he called out in the name of Jesus but he actually spoke the actual name of this entity that he believed was revealed to him after the praying and the fasting and he said, episode stopped in a split second and that the guy actually approached him after that. Like, like, dude, what did you do? Like, all of a sudden I lost my power and I was back, like, what happened? And so Russ told him what, what he had done. And the guy, it's just a military guy, was shocked because everything in his training, he had been taught, this is just something that you do. You tap into the brain and it's all Monroe Institute and Hemisync and Robert Monroe. And it's all like something like psychic ability. So when, the, when the military guy actually found out that this was something spiritual and that that was actually a, a demon enabling that gift that he had, I think it actually spooked him as well. But so whether it's DNA or it's a demonic ritual, you know, if you're, if someone has to actually do a ritual to get this done, they need a blood sample or what it's all the same. It, it's blood. It's, it's DNA. It's blood. And so I, I go into length in the book about the, the similarities between sleep paralysis entities and our modern supposedly fictional vampire lore, because I do believe that what's going on here, I do believe it is a type of a blood covenant. It's a type of a threshold covenant. And these things are ancient. And again, these entities are capitalizing on our ignorance because we have long forgotten these ancient traditions. We still have uh, hints of them in our culture here. Like uh, when we do a handshake, like for a deal, that goes back to old threshold covenants where they would slaughter an animal and the two people who were going to covenant with each other would dip their hands in the blood and then they'd shake hands. And so now we just, we do the handshake, but mm. it's a, it's a carryover from these ancient threshold covenants. And so I do think that what is happening in the astral, whether we remember it or not, is by way of invitation, we're letting these shadow people or whatever they are over the threshold into our bedroom. And they've been invited to do so. Now we're in covenant with these things. And so the, the issue isn't just, well, if I say Jesus, they go away. Because again, if, if Alvarino is right, that's going to throw an entire wrench in this easy band-aid fix. So anytime you have sleep paralysis or a UFO abduction experience, just say, call it in the name of Jesus and it'll stop like that. If Alvarino's right, it doesn't matter if it stops. It's all, the damage has been done. What mm. just happened in Nashville? What covenant was made? Who am I now bound to? What sort of attachments am I taking back to the physical with me? So it's a much, much more serious issue than I played with a Ouija board once when I was 15, or I listened to heavy metal music or smoking the weed, you know, this and that. These are actual betrothal like covenants that are going on in the astral. And we just have to take them, I think, a lot more seriously than we have before. And I'm seeing this trend now on the internet with like, learn how to get sleep paralysis, learn an auto, out of body experience, learn how to astral project. Mm. And people are intrigued by this and they think it's going to be fun or they think that they're going to, you know, uh, some sort of like love potion. They're going to, you know, get the, you know, guy they like after, you know, whatever. We're trifling with things that we have absolutely no concept of the depth of what we're getting yeah. ourselves into. Yeah. yeah. It, it sounds like people who have these gifts and really go into it and understand it. They, they move from a state of, of defense, which is like praying in the name of Jesus because they're in this defensive mode. They're stuck, they're, they're fight or flight, and they're just, they, they can only think to yell at Jesus. The people who go to offense and own their faith and, and really pray the prayers and, and understand exactly the war they're in, there seems to be some, some sort of shift. And I think Daniel spends a lot of time with SRA survivors teaching them how to do that. And I've read some other books of people who see in the spirit and they say they were attacked as young kids. And it wasn't until they had a shift in how they understood who Christ is in their life and, and the, in the authority that they have that these things stopped. So 
Daniel sounds like he he has success with people who who've been abducted, and then it stops when they when they really begin to understand what's going on and how to get out of that. Yeah. I think sometimes we just become Christians, we accept Christ, but we're still sort of floundering. We don't really know what we're doing. We don't really know how to operate in spiritual offense of what's what's coming at us. Yeah. We're just sort of trying, like, yeah. hopefully it doesn't happen tonight, you know? Yeah. I mean, so yeah, so Vicky Joy, how, how are people stopping this, right? Like, I mean, because if you're, we're talking about Tim and we're talking about, you know, the abduction phenomena and I mean, there's power in the name of Jesus, right, to stop things. But the idea then is to stop it. From that's, that could be a band aid. The idea isn't to stop it from happening altogether, yeah. to to break the whatever the pattern or break the or close the door. I don't know, whatever you want to talk or, or say or talk or, or what sort of semantics you want to use. What have yeah. you found that like that how people get out of this or uh, unentwined in, in these situations? Because it seems to target specific people. Maybe you can provide some color on, on, on who and why you think it targets specific people, but. Also, how people will get out of it because yeah. and this is a lot of dark stuff. And I always like to, Nate, we always like to try to give people hope on, on all this stuff because it's it's important to know your enemy. We talked about this at the beginning, but we are also bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Absolutely. And, and we are no longer under the curse of sin and death. And so that means that we have the power through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, to authority over this stuff. And and so I that is my question. It's two part is is who are they, who and why are they going after certain people? And how are you finding that people are able to get themselves out of these repeat sort of patterns of, of sleep paralysis as, as we are sort of talking about it? Great questions. And that, this is really getting down to the nitty gritty. And, and I do chapter six of the book goes on at length about all of this as well. But I have found in my, my research that a lot of times with sleep paralysis, as well as the UFO abduction phenomenon, many, many times, not a hundred percent, nothing ever has a perfect category. Many times these are people who have had excessive amounts of childhood trauma. So there was something, you know, big. In, you know, in, in the childhood. And so um, I, I've also found, and again, this is not a 100% cut and dry, but statistically, a lot of the people that have the sleep paralysis phenomenon, have, they've had childhood trauma, but the UFO abduction phenomenon, many times, it's specific to sexual abuse related trauma. And we see a difference even in the the end goals of both, because a lot of times with the UFO abduction things, we it, there is a lot of sexual stuff in in many of the astral uh, the the sleep paralysis, the astral experiences. Uh, people are being spiritually transformed. They're becoming spokespeople for the new age and the ascension doctrine and the coming great awakening. And so, by way of like who they're targeting, I've noticed a trend in trauma, but I've also noticed i'm speculating here but my research is taking me towards the possibility that the people that are being targeted are of a particular bloodline mm -hmm. or bloodlines and and so what i'm still trying to figure out is are they trying to recruit their own like you you have lost touch with who you really are you're you're uh, of a, the Atlantean bloodline, or you're the RH bloodline, you're the reptilian bloodline, you're the Nephilim bloodline, you belong to us, and you don't even understand it. But it, is it a taking of their own ancestry? Or, and I suppose it could be a combination of the two or something I haven't thought of. Is it a wanting to pollute Seth's bloodline? Like, let's, let's take the people who are of Seth's bloodline and corrupt and recruit them for, for our side. And so, again, I just think so much of this has to do with blood. It has to do with bloodlines. It has to do with genetics. It has to do with blood covenants being made. You know, we see it in the Bible. And it, that never made sense to me as a kid. Like, why does everything mm. have to do with blood? Why did an animal have to be sacrificed? Why did Jesus have, why, how come with the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins? Why is it blood? And so research of, of sleep paralysis, I'm finding all of these breadcrumbs that lead to bloodlines, blood covenants, blood sacrifices. Mm. 
you know, and the trauma piece that you see in it, and this this coincides with satanic ritual abuse, it coincides probably with a lot of what Dan Duvall has has come to discover. Trauma is a, you know, trauma-based mind control is a huge part of of building this super soldier army, you know, this black awakening that Russ mm-hmm. Dizdar talks about, these MK Ultra people. And so it seems like you cannot successfully produce a trauma-based mind control person soldier without the trauma and so the trauma can can happen both within and without the actual experience of the sleep paralysis or or the ufo abduction and so and i know that was the case with me and one of the things that i found so fascinating in my research with a lot of my case studies of people who have had sleep paralysis since they were a tiny child and it's followed them their whole life many of them including myself can point to 10, 15, 20 times in their life where they legitimately should have lost their lives, like a very near fatal accident, some sort of surgery or something that happened on the operating table. And I could tell you a bunch of them. When I was in junior high, I went flying out of a Jeep on a freeway and my uncle literally grabbed me in midair and like slammed me back in the car. And I was on a missions trip overseas once and I was separated from my my students and i was surrounded by 10 men in black with wow. swords and cried on the name of jesus and like they literally just dispersed it was just the craziest thing I, i've got like at least 15 of those types of stories and many people that have this so it's almost like these people who are being targeted are going to be taken out one way or the other right we're either going to transform your soul into our our the, theology you know we're, you're gonna you're gonna be one of us <laughs> and if not we're gonna try to get rid of you and to your point nate and you said a mouthful mm. a minute ago i love i love what you just said because it was my experience but i don't think i ever articulated it like that mm. i was a victim of this my whole life jesus 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 help jesus that and terrified the next few days. I'd be looking over my shoulder. I'd be scared it was going to happen again the next day. I'd be telling my friends, like, oh, it happened again. And like, I was just, and in fact, it bothered me because I thought, how come, even though this has happened hundreds of times, I'm just as scared now as I was that, like, what, at what point do you like have a learning curve with this? Mm-hmm. And it, it was the same thing for, for me, Nate, there was a point where I was like, I'm not the victim here. These guys have no power. I've got the name of Jesus. I can plead the blood of Jesus over the thresholds in my home and over my body. And I've got Psalm 91 and I've Mm. got the word of God and I've got worship and I've got fasting and I've got these prayers I can pray. And as soon as I started to fight back, it, it doesn't happen anymore. It, it, it doesn't now doesn't mean that they're not kind of trying to find back doors. they, They always do, but. I, I just love the way you said that, Nate, because well, that it's just so true. When we get emails from people who are Christians their whole lives, there's a familiar theme of people who reach out to our show, and it's that they've been in church, they've been in the faith, but there's all these things they didn't understand. Yes. And it makes me think, guys, that is this why the church just constantly focuses on just the the moment of Christ's death and the crucifixion? And that's really constantly all we talk about. So we're constantly in this place of like, you know, I, growing up, I heard the, the salvation message probably a thousand times before I was, because I went to Christian school from when I was time I was in kindergarten. So I graduated high school. And I wonder if that is, is something that it's just, we don't, we don't really understand the story, the concept, the characters. And so we just kind of focus on this one thing, which I think is important. I think it's, I think the gospel is important. I think salvation is important, but I think it keeps Christians sort of in this state of, you know, infancy in our faith and an infant sounds like an easy prey, easy target. You can get attacked if you don't really understand the concepts of your faith, you know, and, and the Bible talks about, you know, getting into the, into the mill, into the meat, you know, the real sustenance of what is this that we're, that we're a part of. And I wonder if, if by, which is, which is kind of a lot of what we talk about on our show. It's just like heavy topics, entities, creatures, abductions, aliens, a category of darkness. And people, they plug this into their faith and then they email us like, whoa, I, I'm going to church. I'm I'm back. I'm reading my Bible again. It's like, yeah, this that's what this is. So I, I don't know if that's a strategy of the enemy to kind of keep people in this infant state because yeah, your salvation is taken care of. You're in the family of God again, but your life could be total hell. 
you could be getting attacked every single day. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not, you're not part, you're not doing anything. You're just getting arrow shot at you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. You're, you're firing, firing on all cylinders now, Nate, because th this is one of the things. So Michael Lake, I don't know if you guys have heard of Michael Lake. He's amazing. Um, so, so what, what Lake says is, and, and again, this can be triggering. So Christians hear me out. Um, <laughs> Salvation is a great thing, okay? And Jesus did talk about salvation, and he offers it to us. But the gospel that he was preaching was not the gospel of salvation. And all you have to do is do a word search in Scripture in the New Testament of the word gospel, and it's almost always embedded in the phrase gospel of the kingdom. He wasn't preaching a gospel of salvation. In fact, on time-wise, like on the timeline, it wouldn't have even made sense. This is how this is how Jesus in the first century would have preached a modern salvation message. At some point in the future, I'm going to die on a cross. And when I raise from the dead, it's going to trigger a period where you can start asking for forgiveness of your sins. And then you can invite me into your heart. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what he was preaching was there are two kingdoms. They're at war with each other. Right now, the kingdom of earth has been legally handed over to Satan because of the fall of man. When I die, I'm going to get those keys back. And one day I'm going to come back and claim what's mine, this kingdom. When I come back to establish my kingdom, you better be on the right side. Pick a side. He was saying, pick a side, pick a side. And so the gospel of the kingdom, it doesn't negate salvation. It, it doesn't say that salvation isn't a piece of that. Like, let's talk about the diamond analogy again. Salvation is one of the 52 facets of this gospel of the kingdom diamond. So yes, it's important and we should be teaching people to observe and telling people how to be saved. But when we reduce everything down to praying a prayer and now you're saved, we miss out on the fact that we're in a cosmic war and we're cannon fodder if we don't understand what's going on. And to your point exactly, that's great that we're saved and we go to church and we're learning all this great stuff and we're in the word and Jesus loves us. But if we're getting slaughtered by the enemy on a daily basis and we're being attacked and we're being harassed and our physiological, emotional, mental, physical and spiritual states are all being negatively and profoundly affected by the influence that these things have over us. Why would we, why would we settle for that? Why, why would we settle for that when Jesus has said, you know, no weapon formed against you will prosper. So what I would ask people is if these weapons are prospering against you, something's missing in your formula. Hmm. It, it's difficult because a lot of denominations are, they're they're centered around can you lose your salvation you can't lose your salvation i mean it seems like everyone is just stuck in this this one moment they're stuck at the cross they don't move beyond the cross and i think that you know you have to understand this is what led up to the cross and what comes after the cross and everyone's just huddled around the cross all the time constantly debating this moment in history and we don't know anything about genesis we don't know anything about revelation and we're just stuck at this one moment in time that's how I see it. And it's not that it's not a poem. It's a pivotal point in, in history, but it's not the only part of the Bible's history, but we're stuck there. That's the like only thing we can all agree on sometimes. And then it, the church fractures in a million pieces because, well, you can't lose your salvation. Well, you can lose your salvation. And, uh, and it's like, well, what are, what are we actually fighting against? What, what, what kind of war are we in and what are we doing? You know? And it's frustrating because it just stays there. And yeah, and I, I, dude, I think though that 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 makes that that moment that the cross matter that much more. I think it's the context that makes it matter that much more. Exactly. It's when it's when Jesus laid down his life to bring us bring us back into his, into the family of God. But in, in all the things he did, he took like you said, Vicky, he took the, the keys of of death and Hades. He he took in his victory there, and he went. What you can you can surmise that he went and declared his victory to the to those in prison, to the watchers in prison, and after the rebellion on Mount, on Mount Hermon. But I mean, I understand in some ways why people get stuck there, Nate, is because this is the most profound thing that that by far has happened in the history of, of humankind. But it, I think, what I think I hear is that like it just we we lack a lot of the context to understanding exactly 
what it did because i think it was so, we talked about this with doug and and even mike heiser a bit was that just it was so much more than it was our salvation and right it's the idea that mm-hmm. there's so much more that also happened there that i think mm-hmm. maybe we just we oftentimes stop there like yeah he died for our sins and now we're saved great i mean not great but that's that's that is the most miraculous thing that's ever happened in human in, in the history of humankind yes but it did yeah. also also did a lot of other things. And if you don't, if you don't have a typical, if you don't have the proper context for it, I think I think sometimes you don't understand how the magnitude of, mm-hmm. of, of of that. That's all I'm saying is that we stay there because it's like we're afraid. We're sort of afraid to go go back to Genesis and watch the the opening five minutes, which is the most important part of any film. It's like okay, you know, out of this this scene here in in, in the garden, it's going to come christ and what's he going to do he's going to reclaim all these things that were lost many things that were lost not just our salvation not just our airship to the, to heaven but all these other bloodlines that were corrupted all these other darknesses it's just that I, I just think that you know for me just doing this show has made me understand so much more of like why we need a savior what we're being saved from the multiple kingdoms that war with each other and often how they the darkness mirrors, like you're saying, the light, and they deceive so many people. This is the part where every time there's a sermon on the cross, I wish they would talk about this part. When, when he went down to Tartaru for those three days and delivered like the most awesome cosmic throat punch in history to those guys, right? Yeah. Just took those keys back. This is the culmination of Genesis. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Mm-hmm. That the seed of Eve yeah, what, was yeah. was going to crush the the head of the serpent, and the the fact that thousands of years went by, and all this corruption, and all of these things were those watchers in their little control center down in the abyss are thinking, "We're winning, we're winning." We're this guy's asleep up there, you know. That they probably just thought, "Oh man, he's forgotten all about that little thing in the garden." Oh, we've got this, and then all of a sudden they got him in the grave. They're like. We all right. We won. Mm-hmm. We won. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they're down there and they hear this. <laughs> you know, like what? And mm-hmm. Jesus enters into this impenetrable fortress that no one has ever come in or out of since the day they were put there, and is like, "You lose. Game over." Like the mm-hmm. fulfillment of that. And so, yeah, he rose from the dead, and he, it, you know. It's all about us. He saved me and eh, me, 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 me. But I think we miss the cosmic glory in the resurrection story when we don't explain that Jesus getting the keys and where he went to get them and who he took them from. uh, That to me is the most mind blowing part of the love story because it shows just the long suffering and the patience and just the intelligence of this God who's in the background, quietly weaving together the exact timing of the fulfillment of this, of this promise and of this prophecy. And I, I, I just think the whole, like those three, the the three days in Tartaru, that's just the most supernatural, I think, part of the story. Yeah. 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 If we had like a, a, like, (laughs) <laughs> oh, uh, the extended version of the the passion of christ we would get some yeah we get some oh, really man. wild stuff but I, I and i say all this because so many people email our show and they feel like they're trapped and they're stuck and they can't they don't know what to do they're being you know who do i talk to who do i email i believe in jesus but i'm i'm experiencing all this stuff and i just think that man for the majority of us we don't beyond salvation we don't really know we're, we're kind of clueless. And, you know, a lot of people debate, well, was Book of Enoch a big part of that? And, and did that deliberately get edited out and all this other stuff that kind of comes and goes on our show? And you wonder if the goal, part of the goal of the enemy is to keep people in a state of naivety, not understanding. I don't say all that to say that the gospel is not important and that salvation is not important. I just think that. Right. Until all the other characters were plugged in, I was like, oh, this is this is what's going on. And then my, you know, journey really understanding a lot of these things changed. And and I just think that a lot of people who listen to weird weird shows like this and paranormal stuff and they plug in even just the, the idea of the Nephilim, you know, this 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 corrupted 
part of creation. And then there's this flood and there are all these stories and it leads up and then boom, here comes, you know, the savior on the scene. It's just a way better entrance when you understand when and why it rolls into history. So people who are experiencing sleep paralysis, I think sometimes maybe they don't understand that they have the power and all authority. And it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more than just yelling out the name of Jesus in a state of panic. That's all. That's really what I want to kind of hammer home. It's, it's, you've got to understand how much authority you've been given and you have to speak out of it and you have to pray out of it. And even in my own life, you know, doing this show, there's days when it's just like, it just feels like things are coming at us, coming at me, coming at my mind. Just where is this coming from? And it's like, I, I don't, maybe I don't even take it serious enough that we're, Luke and I are rattling on against the, all these topics all the time. And sometimes it feels like our personal lives, it's just like crazy stuff's happening. And, and I don't even know if I'm armoring my mind and my heart and my soul daily enough. Mm-hmm. All of us need to. It just makes you to realize how much more serious you have to take these things. And it's, and it's sad that some people get abducted and it's sad that some people get constantly terrorized and it's, it's everyone's getting terrorized in some way. It's just the, the weirder ones are the ones we kind of migrate towards. And we were talking about, st- it's like sleep paralysis or abductions are probably in the top of the list. You know, it's just strange. Why those people? Yeah. 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 It, it certainly is. And, you know, I, I have a, at the very back of the book, I have this prayer mapping exercise kind of, here's a step one. Cause I think a lot of us, we, you know, a lot of the, the emails I get, people will self-diagnose, you know, they'll say, this has been happening to me. And then they'll say, I know it's because I smoke marijuana, or I know it's because I played with that Ouija board. Or it's, I know this is because I was promiscuous in the sixties. Like, so they'll self-diagnose and it's again, not to make light of things that do legitimately open doors. But again, we have to graduate beyond the youth group definition of a pursuit of holiness, you know, and I, I just think we have to graduate from the milk onto the meat and realize that there are other ways. There are people out there who don't smoke pot and don't sleep around. They haven't done ayahuasca that are get, there are godly people who haven't opened up all of the, the, the cliche doors, right. Who are, who are experiencing this. And so what are we missing? And so mm-hmm. there's a prayer, ma- there's a prayer mapping exercise. I, I suggest at anyone, even if you think, you know, what has opened this door, it'll benefit you because if, if the enemy can keep hidden from you, the open door he has, he's obviously mm-hmm. going to keep that hidden from you. And I, and this isn't like a one or done thing. I'll prayer map periodically. And I'm always surprised at sort of the banal things that, that come out of that. Like you always expect something like, you know, your house is built on an in, ancient Indian burial ground. Like, you know, like we want, we want some big thing. Yeah. But s- sometimes it's just these banal things that I'll like remember from, you know, childhood or something like an invisible friend I had that had like a really specific name and, and like, you know, things like that. And so, um, so just prayer map and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is the source mm. of this experience what is the source mm-hmm. and there might be more than one and it might be a quick and easy thing it might be a really long thing you know one thing that we really have to do whether we're going to prayer map or whether or not we just even want to research or look into these things we're always supposed to count the cost and after every chapter in my book i have a page of warfare points and a cleansing prayer because you can open doors just in having an unhealthy interest in this and getting titillated by it and um, you know, there's motives for why you should, you should study this too. And so we have to count the cost. And for those of us that have had these experiences, even prayer mapping and saying, okay, reveal to me the source, you better be prepared that that answer might not be anything you imagined. And it might be frightening. It might require sacrifice. It might require killing sin. It might require the gardener to come with the heavenly chainsaw and start lobbing off precious branches in order to prune you. So if you, it's kind of like if you have an alcohol addiction, it's like, you're always at that point where I want free from all of the negative consequences of this, but I don't really want to be free from the alcohol because that part's fun. And so you have to get to the point where you're like, I am so sick and tired of this. I cannot stand one more David. Once you get to the point where you're like, I have got to get, I, I cannot live like this anymore. This is, this is destroying my 
my spiritual walk. This is, this is destroying my intimacy with Christ. I could have so much more depth and intimacy in this walk and so much more power over, over the spiritual warfare aspects. And so mm. when, when you're, when you're to that point, you know, then you start to prayer map, but just understand that there are things that we haven't even tackled on shows like this before things that haven't even been disclosed yet. The, the things that these entities are capable of doing by way of deception. Mm -hmm. And if, if the Holy spirit comes and reveals to you something a lot more basic than all the little internet things, you know, out there, it, it, it could be, it, I don't want to scare people, but when I got to the point where I was like, I am going to get over this. And I prayed some prayers and uh, I prayed an innocent little prayer one day, this is back in 2011. And I prayed and I said, you know, we always invite Jesus into our hearts, but if the mind is the battlefield and that's where the enemy attacks us and that's where a lot of this astral stuff goes on, if, if the mind is kind of where it's at, don't, don't I want Jesus up there too? And so I was just a little, oh, Jesus, come and live in my mind too. You know, and I just thought it was this cool little Saturday morning Christian prayer and I had a good devotion that morning and I wrote it in my hmm. journal and went on my way. That prayer, I'm not, I am not joking when I tell you guys that prayer Oh, I almost lost my life getting that prayer because the warfare was so intense for so many years when I realized how much of my born again, Christian evangelical Bible degree from college mind was occupied by the enemy, how much of a stronghold and he doesn't let go of things that he has control over and the warfare and the trauma and the heartaches and the brokenness that I went through to fully hand the deed of my mind over to Jesus. Had he not intervened, he, the enemy would have sifted me like wheat. So tread lightly on this stuff, guys. And when you prayer map and when you try to find the source of these things, uh, just know that you are treading on uncharted waters where Things that the enemy might have have had in his back pocket your whole life. If 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 that stuff starts getting taken from him, he's going to be angry. Like you have just agitated the enemy of your soul, and mm. he is not going to leave without a fight. So just be prepared for the fight. And Nate, to your point, we're not the victims here. So we got a sword. We've got the armor. We've got the shield. We got the word of God. We have the name of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing. We have got everything it takes to slay this enemy. But just know that, you know, we read stuff in the Bible, like David took five stones and shot one. And on the first shot, the, the giant went down and it was, you know, it, it makes it sound like it was such a simple little thing and God did all the work, but God only knows how much terror was ripping through that little kid's heart as he was running towards that thing. I, I imagine mm -hmm. he probably wet his pants. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, Vicky. We you know, we didn't talk too much about like what people see. I, I was going to say my last question for you is like, what's the, the story of sleep paralysis that that stands out of all the ones you've heard? Because a lot of times people just think if they have a bad dream, it's sleep paralysis. Yeah, and it's not the same thing. So, what's the one story that like sort of gives gives people context when they this is what sleep paralysis looks like and actually is? Yeah. Well, so um, I'll give you a, a personal story of one of them that happened to me within the last few years. And this is when I was trying to, I, I was trying to determine, am I really seeing my bedroom or am I seeing an overlay? And so I came up with this great test, you know, and, and anytime you try to outsmart these things, they get mad and they just, t they just take it up a notch. So don't try to be too cute with these things, but I thought I was really going to outwit these things and I was going to sleep with a sleep mask on. So I would know if I had sleep paralysis that whether or not I could see my room or not. And so, you know, I was wearing this thing for months, just waiting for it to happen. And so it finally happened one night and I had the sleep mask on. So I a hundred percent knew that, you know, even if my eyes were opened, it was tightly sealed under underneath the sleep mask. And I, the sleep paralysis experience started. And it was the craziest thing, you guys. It was like my sleep mask. This is what's weird. Instead of seeing a whole room, 
I could only see something that like in front of me that was in the shape of my sleep mask. I couldn't see anything beyond it. And the inside of my sleep mask turned into a mirror. And I was looking at my own face and my, the reflection in this sleep mask mirrored exactly how I was feeling at that moment. And it was a trifecta of terror because a, it's the sleep paralysis experience in, in and of itself is scary. Mm. Two, I'm realizing, you know, oh my word, it's not my room. It's not my room. I've been looking at all these years. And then the third thing that was so scary is they have control of my visual cortex right now. They could make me see anything. And if I don't wake up, I might see something graphic. I might, they, I might start seeing demons. I might start seeing something frightening. And so the, the feeling of terror with, with people with sleep paralysis, it's, there's a, difference between a nightmare or you know that fear that adrenaline pumping fear like when you think someone's broken into your house and you hear footsteps in the other room like it that doesn't even compare it doesn't touch this level of terror it it is literally i think it's a hint of the hopeless kind of fear people are going to experience on judgment day when they hear go away i never knew you it is the most hopeless sense it's not even terror it is utter hopelessness uh which we interpret as terror but for me and a lot of people will say this when they have this experience it is it is a feeling of um i'm gonna die i'm not gonna wake up from this i'm gonna be dragged to hell there's no hope and in fact a lot of times that's what the voice is either audibly or in your head are saying like you're you have no hope no one can hear you and and so I, I think that the thing that, that makes most sleep paralysis experiences, uh, the, thing, the thing that they all have in common is this terror that goes beyond just fear. And the, the fear will often linger. And one thing I do want to tell people is when the event is over, continue to pray those warfare prayers because just because something stopped does not mean that there isn't still a presence there in your room. You usually can kind of feel when they're gone, but it doesn't mean that something hasn't attached. You have to pray right then and there. If, if anything has attached to me, you you have to, to do all the prayers to, it's it's not just as easy as praying Jesus and going, phew, that was a close one. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you have to do before, during, and after the experience. And I outline that at length in my book too, because there's a lot of things you have to do before. If you're not prepared for this kind of a fight before it happens, you're not gonna be prepared in the heat of the moment. You know, it, it'd be like sending the Marines over, over, you know, to Afghanistan and they never went to boot camp. You know, they never learned how to fire a weapon. It, you know, on the front lines of battle is not the time to start trying to figure out how to shoot your weapon. Yeah, that's yeah, true, right? <laughs> you don't know how to put it together by then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Man, cool. well, thanks for sharing that that story. I think that's, that's difficult for a lot of people. And I think some people out there, you know, it helps them put together some, some clues. And that's what a lot of our, our stories on our show do you know a lot of people email us and we don't necessarily know what to tell people we get a lot of messages and it's that you know we're, we're so busy just trying to get this show out once a week and and deal Man. with all the other things that it's like sometimes people people ask us they want to know and they don't have any resources so hopefully more and more guests like you coming on and, and sharing these experiences and and writing books about this and the books they only come out at night you can get the book on amazon there i'm guessing is. Uh, no, actually, it's exclusively available on lamarzuli.net. Okay, let's go, LA baby. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Love it. Well, Vicky Joy, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for making time for us and for our show. Thanks, guys. Thanks Had for a getting, great a, time. getting a t yeah. shirt. I mean, yeah, she's wearing the, a Camp Nephilim shirt. You're on the top of the pedestal right now for guests that show up in, in gear. It's phenomenal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the time. Tell people where they can also find you and they find the book at lamarzuli.net where they can find you where they can interact with you if they have had experiences and they want to reach out absolutely how, how to find it yeah yep you can find me at vickyjoyanderson.com vicky is spelled v-i-c-k-i and for the young folks out there on instagram and tiktok i am v-j-a author all right let's go thank you so much thanks Appreciate so much it. for the time yeah that was awesome. thank you guys loved it yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll let you know when this comes out. And, uh, okay. Yeah, I'll give All you right. a heads up. Thanks so much, Vicky. Cool. Yeah, thank thank you. you. All right. See All you. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.